Ephesians of Israel. The Ephesians of Israel pointing out that the Ephesians were Israelites uh, predominantly. And that's who the Apostle Paul came unto, and that's who he is addressing. Uh, then there's uh, another part of this. I think it's going to be three of the Holy Spirit included in this. We've got many more things to say on the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be able to cover them all, but we certainly want to get into that. So get in your Bibles. One of the first verses we're going to go to, and you may just want to start turning there, is Hebrews um, no, I don't want to go there just yet. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Now, while you're turning there, I just want to inject this about Judge Roy Moore. He's a chief justice in Alabama, and I just want to say, God bless that man. He's standing up against the homosexuals. Amen? In fact, I uh, listened to him a little bit this morning, and he said, that they are redefining words. How true, and he went into some other things, but he's talking about and explaining that this so-called federal jurisdiction over state uh, jurisdiction is a facade. And that, uh, And that's why he's standing up against it. Uh, I just would to God that more people would come around him, support him by the millions and just show up and let their light shine for one thing. Uh, Another is, I want to bring up something that's going to be, uh, um, well, just hold on to your seats. All I can say is let me finish what I'm saying first before you uh, pass out. And that is, why isn't there more queer music today? Yes, you heard me correctly. Why isn't there more sodomite music today? You may say, and I'm with you, you don't want it. Of course we don't want it. It's unbiblical. It's uh, ungodly. It's It's unrighteous. God's Word speaks against it clearly. But the world is telling us that they love it. My question to you is, do they really? Do they really love queer music? Let's just use one example, Elton John. Why, you hear his music all the time, but you don't hear any of his music about uh, the homosexual love lifestyle, homosexual love music. And, of course, let me add again, God, I'm thankful for that. I mean, um appreciate that we aren't hearing it. However, they're claiming to come out of the closet now and throwing lots of these queer scenarios to us in their uh, TV shows and other things, slowly introducing it in lots of various ways. But if they really were coming out of the closet... Why don't we have more queer love songs? Because they claim to be coming out of the closet. Well, if you're really coming out of the closet, why aren't there more queer love songs? I'll tell you why. It's because the public wouldn't want it. The the public clearly does not want to turn on their radio and hear queer love songs. Would you like that? Of course you wouldn't. But they say they we're coming out. No, they're not coming out of the closet. And they're not playing that because it would turn against them. At least I believe so right now. Now they can do what they want, pretty much are doing what they want and throwing these things at us and cramming it in our face and every, all that kind of stuff. But you think about what I just said. The reason they're not playing that kind of music is because the public doesn't want it. All right, now... Let's quickly move on to something else. Our uh, topic today, which we're going to be dealing with the uh, Holy Spirit again, but let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians. 
And I was there, and I moved away. So I'm going to have to find again. Chapter 1, and um, what did I say? Verse 13, I believe. So hang in there. Here we go. Quote, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, Israel's inheritance, as we explained already in previous sermons, until the redemption the redemptive act of Christ upon the cross to redeem his people Israel. That's what this term redemption means and how it is applied unto the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We, Israel, are the purchased possession. And when we're looking at the uh, Holy Spirit here, and the Holy Spirit of promise, it all goes hand in hand with what we're being uh, told here, but it also goes hand in hand with the new covenant. Uh, Remember what we've read in Romans 9, verse 4. If you're curious what that says, write it down. Go back and look it up again. But here in... uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 8, which we've read many times before, it says, For finding fault with them, Israel, he saith, Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, write them into their hearts, and I will be in them a God, and they shall be unto me a people. What I'm suggesting to you is that these verses are also uh, concerning the spirit of promise. That this is how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to write his laws within his people's minds and heart. And I think a lot of people um, clearly miss that and the purpose of the new covenant. So many churches today are called the New Covenant Churches again, and they misapply and take out of biblical context what the New Covenant is, who it is written unto, which is Israel, and that it does include God's laws. We cannot proceed, we cannot have righteousness, we cannot have holiness, and grow nationally in the kingdom understanding and have kingdom principles if we push aside God's law. We can't do it. And the Bible doesn't take us in that direction, but Judeo-Christianity does. I want you to turn now, and we're trying to move rather quickly in this. Please bear with me, because we have a lot to cover today. And that is uh, Acts chapter 15. Let's go to uh, verse 17 and just read that real quick. Acts chapter 15 and verse 17. And boy, you get some weird interpretations on this because people do not understand the meaning of the word Gentile and they apply it to any and everybody. Well, here's what this verse says. And you, I want you to think on it and the way it's written. Quote, that the residual of men, residual? What might the residual of men apply to? Might that apply to the divorced northern house of Israel? I'm suggesting to you, yes, that were put away in divorce by God Almighty, 
They are still Israel. They are still going to be brought back in the terms and the bonds of the new covenant. All right? Residual men might seek after the Lord. And notice this now. All Gentiles upon whom my name, notice my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth, who doeth all, th- um, all these things. Again, we're going to focus in on the uh, center part of this verse. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. Is this now opening the door where the non-Israelites, which the the Judeo-Christian world calls the Gentiles, bringing them in and giving them the name of Israel, No, this is clearly, and especially the way that it's worded, unto the nations of the lost, divorced, regathered Israelites, the Gentilized Israelites. So I want to point that out to you and how many people, especially in the Judeo-Christian world, have uh, misinterpreted this verse. All right. So we don't have a different God in the New Testament, as I've said many times, and will continue to say, uh, we do not have a different people that are his covenant people, and that the same kingdom calling that is upon Israel is still there in the New Testament or the New Covenant. Now, we read earlier from Hebrews chapter 8, and we were talking about um, God's law being applied and the uh, new covenant calling and purposes unto Israel. Both, it says, Judah and Israel. Again, I am saying to you, and the Word of God is saying to you, really, that this is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. When we start seeing righteousness, which will exalt the nation and the people, and we start seeing God's law written upon Israel's heart, we're going to see wonderful changes. We're not seeing that because what do they want to do? They want to Judeo-Christianize us. They want to multiculturalize us. Now, earlier we were reading about the uh, Gentiles. Let me just ask the question, uh, which the Judeo-Christian world would apply it, and uh, and his name would be upon them. Would that apply to the pygmies? Oh, you say, Pastor Barley, you got to bring up the pygmies again? Well, let me just ask you, would they not be in the Judeo-Christian interpretation of uh, the Gentiles? And I'm just asking the question again, would his name be upon them? Would it be upon the Aborigines? Would it be upon the people in Haiti? Would it be upon the people in Mexico again, as we were talking earlier, who are in pagan Catholicism? And there are others that we could bring up, but I'm asking those questions because I think they're very pertinent and When wrongly applied, we open the door to any and all people and we invite in multiculturalism and all kinds of problems develop from that. I'm going to give you just a, uh, well, one big example of that today as um, we go on in our lesson. Now, this is referring to, in Hebrews, uh, a Holy Spirit led understanding, because that's the way it is described to us. And he's going to write his laws within our minds and in our hearts. I'm suggesting to you again, that is clearly of the Holy Spirit. What we see manifest as the Holy Spirit today in so many churches, So, or let's say like, you may want examples, Pentecostalism. Oh, I know many of you are claim Pentecostal. You claim to speak in tongues. Uh, I was listening the other day because some lady has just told me the wonders of 
uh, Andrew Walmack, and he just constantly putting forth the idea of speaking in tongues. Come to his place. He'll get filled with the Spirit, and you'll start speaking in tongues. And uh, I know a number of you through various ministers and ministries, the ecumenicalism and uh, uh, Catholicism, speak in tongues, and you've had various, quote, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, led uh, experiences. I think it's time that I once again go on to what I experienced a long time ago in the early 70s on getting filled with the Holy Spirit after I came out of the Baptist church. Every time the preacher would speak of the Holy uh, Spirit or the Holy Ghost and, and saying to everybody in the audience, if you want to get filled with the Holy Ghost, come down the aisle here. We'll lay hands on you. You'll start speaking in tongues. Well, I was one of the first ones down the aisle. And I, oftentimes I had uh, 6 to 12 people laying their hands on me and praying for me. And I did this dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Just, I'm, I'm being open with you and relating this experience, and I know a number of you will be saying, well, that's your experience, Pastor. I wasn't mine. I came down and I, they laid hands on me, or I went out in the cornfield and prayed for the Holy Spirit, or uh, uh, someone touched me, and I was just, in the name of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, and I've been speaking in tongues since, and you know, what a blessing it is to me. Well, you know, what can I say about that? Uh, I'm glad it's a blessing to you. Uh, I hope it's the real evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but I question that with some people, not all people, but I question that with some people. I have actually uh, heard about where someone was speaking in tongues and there was a German man at the house hiding in the closet and the man starts speaking in tongues and he came flying out of the closet and said, uh, you don't know German, you're speaking to me in, Ger in German and, uh, you know, what an evidence of speaking in tongues that was. And uh, there were some quite some wonderful things that happened from that uh, particular meeting. And I would say true evidence, because this man couldn't speak German, didn't had never spoke a word in German, speaking to a man who did speak German in the closet. Uh, I would say that's pretty miraculous. Uh, and there are a few other uh, examples like that uh, that are what I would for, refer to as true biblical speaking in tongues. But now, I had gone down the aisle many, many weeks uh, for almost a year and tried it in all kinds of various ways. And finally, one time, there was about six or so uh, people praying for me because if this was speaking in tongues, if speaking in tongues was evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, I wanted it. Okay. And I was like, why are so many people claiming to speak in tongues in this church? And I'm like, Lord Jesus, why can't I? Are they better than me? And because I was wondering that. And yet, let me just add this. It'll upset some of you. A little, but I saw all kinds of, and I'm not going to get deep, in, uh, whoring around by various people, adultery, and playing around and ungodliness, and they would come to church and just start speaking in tongues, smile on their face. I'm like, after a while, I started waking up to this. I'm like, is this really of the Holy Ghost, or is there something else going on here? Well, uh, as I was uh, on my knees and praying, with my hands in the air, as I often did, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Lord Jesus, I need you. Lord Jesus, come unto me. Lord Jesus, give me this gift, etc. And I was very, very sincere about it. 
and uh, this older man says, Brother Barley, just start opening your mouth and start speaking something in tongues. Just start speaking something in tongues, and the Holy Spirit will come into you, fill your life, and you'll have the Holy Spirit. Well, I started uh, opening up my mouth and speaking some gibberish, or what I had heard the minister saying oftentimes, and and all of a sudden they just started jumping up and down and hollering, Brother Barley's filled with the Spirit. And Well, I wanted to be one with the church. I like that church fellowship. Uh, there were many good people there. And uh, so I played along, and I went back and, you know, acting like I'm one of them, acting like the, I was filled with the fruit or the uh, gift of speaking in tongues, but when I sat down, I said to myself, Dave, you know that wasn't real. You know you're not speaking in tongues, that you don't have the gift of speaking in tongues. And I never spoke in tongues like like that again. It was just that one time. Not that I didn't try, but it was just that one time. And it was just re, um, speaking what I thought were words that I'd heard from the uh, minister again. So uh, I continued on like that for a while, like I'm one of the gang, because now I speak in tongues. One night we were at a Bible study, and a good friend of mine, uh, that a good friend of mine was having there, and we went outside to talk, and it was dark, and we just leaning, and it was in Texas, and we were leaning on uh, his, um, the wood fence post outside, and just talking in general and finally i just said to him i said jim i gotta tell you something he said sure dave what's go what's up i said jim ma'am i'm a little bit embarrassed to say this but i said i do not speak in tongues and i went on related other things about that and he just kind of stared out in space for a minute and he turned his head to me says dave let me tell you something. Most people in that church do not also speak in tongues. And I'm like, I said, what? Really? He says, I got to tell you the truth, Dave. I don't either. Jim, you, you, this. I said, you don't speak in tongues. And um, and he says, my wife. And he names some. I guarantee you, they don't speak in tongues. And I'm just, I was just kind of. It hit me very hard in my heart. We talked for a little bit longer, and I just said, look, I've got to get away. I've got to go talk to the Lord. He and I got to have a serious conversation. So I got in my car, and I don't know, for about an hour, I didn't say anything. I didn't know what to say to Jesus. And finally, after about an hour and driving, and I don't know where we were, I was driving, I, I just went for miles and miles, I pulled over and I said, Jesus, you know my heart. You know I love you and I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I said, there's something wrong here. And I think you know, and you obviously know it, but I'm not no longer going to run and hide from this. If this is really of you and this is really how you're filled with the Spirit, being told that all the time, and week after week, I, you know, then I want it, but you can, you can fill me right now. If you want me to speak in tongues, and that's the evidence, Lord Jesus, I just want you to fill me right now. Otherwise, if it's really you, you can fill me whenever you want. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. But I don't think that this speaking in tongues is what it's all cracked up to be. And I had jo such joy and peace in my heart after that. And um, I haven't run from it since. I remember one minister, another minister coming along years after the fact, and his wife spoke in tongues and was constantly rebuking him in church because he was speaking the Israel truth, and she wanted to make sure she shut him down. And there was this uh, speaking in tongues prophecy war going on all the time. It's embarrassing. Everybody was just... 
embarrassed for them and for the church and what was going on there. But one day he sat me down and, Brother Day, why don't you just speak in tongues, you know? Uh, uh, here, have a seat there and I, you know, I'll lay hands on you. I said, you, you know, if you want to do that and, and you claim you can have me speaking in other tongues, let's go for it. And we talked for a little while and he just started backing down from there. He says, well, I think uh, we're just, we'll let Jesus handle that and, and let Jesus uh, fill you with the Holy Spirit and his, on his own good time. I said, that's fine if you want to do that. Um, but I'm telling you, there is something wrong with this movement, ecumenical, ecumenical Pentecostal, uh, Arminian, really, type of a gospel that is not right biblically. It's not really the evidence of speaking in tongues as we are being told. I believe if a person is reading God's Word, trusting God's Word, obeying His commandments, that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And if you can have peace and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have real biblical, notice I said biblical love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., and meekness, you do have evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm well aware in uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 12, that uh, the Apostle Paul gets into more details, and there's other places I know where it talks about speaking in tongues, and there's prophecies, and, they, and things like that. I'm not saying there is not true biblical evidence in some of those cases in which people do have these certain gifts. I'm not sure who, but I do believe there is a problem in people just coming along and saying, well, I have those gifts. Hallelujah, brother. Uh, well, you better think again. You better examine that claim and do so with what the Word of God says about it. And so, real Holy Spirit-led speaking in tongues is not these boogie-woogie, really in a rock and roll. When you go back and you look at, oh, let's say, uh, the Reverend uh, Jimmy Swaggered, and his um, uh, cousin, I believe, and, um, that, was, that was in big time in rock and roll. Can't remember what his name uh, is right now. But he was really uh, big in uh, the rock and roll scene. Do you understand? Really big in the rock and roll scene, and so was Jimmy with him. And uh, what, did, what was uh, one of his favorite songs? Uh, Great Balls of Fire, this uh, uh, guy had done. And uh, has uh, been around for, oh, since the 50s, maybe even the uh, later 40s. But they're interrelated. And Jimmy Swaggart, Mr. Uh, Horn Around Minister, you remember him playing around and and he just couldn't control his uh, sexual desires. Just the best, that's the way it, it happened. And he did it time after time again. How many knows how many times he, do, he, he did it? We just know of the times he got caught with these whores, and really whores. And he professed to be a minister of the gospel, a minister of light, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I remember uh, back in the early 70s, my mother and my grandmother and many other people, lots of of uh, that, that generation were just in love with Jimmy Swaggart and, what, and uh, what he did and his style of preaching and his charismatic gospel. And, you know, a, a, a panel was assembled to deal with Jimmy Swagger's particular problem, and they told him, listen, you need to step down, step out of the ministry at least for a year. And, of course, he didn't listen to him. He 
jumped right back into the ministry and went on TV as soon as he could. And, um, you know, that's not godly. That wasn't the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That was the fruit of the flesh. And yet, now I know a number of you are just saying, well, you're picking on him and everybody sins and falls short of the glory of God, of God Brother Barley, but don't you put, dare put down this uh, speaking in tongues and a lot of this stuff. Well, I am going to do it. I am going to do it. You're telling me that the um, Judeo-Christianity, and you're telling me that this charismatic movement and all that's attached with it is really Holy Spirit-led. You know, you go into a lot of these um, charismatic churches today, you'll find their, it, the uh, the ecumenical movement, they are so multiculturalized. Uh, now it's hard to find hardly any white people in a lot of them. Uh and I'm going to get into that and explain some more on that. So you just hold, hang in there because I think you're going to find what I'm going to be getting into now here uh, pretty interesting. So what I'm saying, so there will not be any misunderstanding, is I believe that 90% of what we see manifest in the Judeo-Christian churches is not true biblical speaking in tongues. I want to go now to this report by uh, that was produced. And uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Don Elmore. He has um, uh, produced this uh, extensive article here, and I'm only going to read a part of it. But he, at the early part of it, he went through and explained that, you know, at the beginning, most of Christianity was based in within the Protestant movement. You know, you had Bat, Baptists, et cetera. But there were, these were in America way back when, in the uh, uh, 1700s, on up to uh, at least and beyond the Civil War uh, period of time. Uh, we had... Uh, mainly the Protestant faith being taught in America. You only had, as that report uh, shows, I think it was Louisiana and maybe Baltimore, had uh, an, a Catholic-infused um, uh, faith or religion going on in those two states only, but most of America was... Protestant. Now, I'm not saying Protestant is without faults or anything like that, but it's much better than the Catholic faith was. Our Puritan pilgrim forefathers were of the Protestant faith, and uh, that was being taught extensively in America. But then some changes started happening. Uh, there was a gradual introduction into what I would call or the Arminian false Judeo-Christian faith. It's where they come down the aisle and they ask Jesus in their life and they get saved and all of a sudden all's one, we're all one big happy family under grace. And more and more times you would, they would um, start gradually doing away with God's law, preaching more grace and not teaching, doing any serious teaching on righteousness and God's laws. At all, and they certainly weren't, uh, as time went on, uh, teaching anything about the biblical new covenant. But I want to read from this paper uh, to you about some interesting history. It's going to start off, um, and it's going to, and while, while we're going through this, it's going to be a little bit hard to figure out. But hang in there as we go through this. Quote. The open communal service, a tradition that was bro brought from Scotland by the Presbyterians, began to be practiced in America. A pastor, James McGreedy, uh, M-C-G-R-E-A-D-Y, organized some of the first 
It soon spread to Logan County, Kentucky, and several other locations near the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. When Pastor McGreedy moved to Logan County, Kentucky, in 1798, near the end of the uh, uh, 18th century or uh, at the beginning of the 1800s there, Logan County, Kentucky, was one of the roughest counties, if not the roughest, in all the state. Quote, and this is taken from Great Revivals and the Great Republic by Warren A. Candler, pages 172 through 173. Quote, the trouble was that no one on the frontier was designated to enforce the law, with the result that Congress could state the immunity which offers experience attracted attracts as to an asylum, think about that, as to an asylum, the most vile and abandoned uh, criminals and all the and all the same time detours useful and virtuous persons from making settlement in such society uh end of quote uh there we're going to go now and quote from just a small little section from uh what most people cherish and cheer on Sea to Shining Sea, that was written by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. This would be from pages 60 through 61. And there, there are, but there's only a short section of this Pastor McGreedy quoted and talked about. Here's what it says. Quote, Logan County attracted so many murderers, horse thieves, highway robbers, and counterfeiters that it was nicknamed Rogue Harbor by those outlaws who fled there to escape justice back east. But within a year, revival began to break out, in the quote, from sea to shiny sea. So a lot of people would read, because uh, that's all it says about it, would read that and think, oh, how great, Oh, how wonderful. They're having murderers and they're having thieves come together for revival, not explaining, not describing it in much detail, if really, if any, about such a revival. Well, let's go on. Uh, not from uh, David Manuel and, and Peter Marshall's book, but we're moving on. I think this is going to get into uh, where we're reading from Revo- Revo- uh, before on the Revivals book. First, it happened in the quarterly command uh, service at the Red River Organization. Then the following month, they celebrated the Lord's Supper at the Gasper River Church. So far, so good. You know, what we're reading a year later at Red River, then Muddy River Church, then Gasper River Church again, similar results. What happened to these profane swearers, murderers, robbers, drunks at these communal services defied logic. As recorded by William Chandler in his above-quoted book, and that is on the Revival book, uh, pages 178 through 179, Pastor Baron W. Stone, a Presbyterian pastor from Bourbon County, Kentucky, expressed what he saw at one of these meetings, quote, There on the edge of a prairie in Logan County, Kentucky, the multitudes came together and continued a number of days and nights and camped on the grounds during which time the worship was carried on in some part of the encampment. The scene was 
new to me and pa- and uh, passing strange, it baffled description, he says. Many, very many, fell down as men slain in the Spirit. Now, you might remember a few, uh, now, a week or so ago, I talked about that letter in which there was uh, this friend that went to the meeting, and there he described Brother Vinny slaying people, so-called slaying people in the Spirit. And I know a number of viewers said, oh, hallelujah, that's bring people closer to God, slaying them in the Spirit. Well, just follow along here. And some of you, I realize I'm wasting my time on, uh, explain some of this. You're just such a die, uh, some of you are so diehard, ecumenical movement and uh, Pentecostalism and speaking in tongues that nothing's going to sway you from it. Uh, I'm well aware of that. But I, for some, many others of you, um, I think you're going to benefit from what this is going to say here. Uh, and continue for hours together in an apparently breathless and motionless state, sometimes for a few minutes, reviving and exhibiting symptoms of life by a deep groan or a piercing shriek, or by prayer for mercy fervently uttered. And let me flip over here real quickly. And it says, um, After lying there for hours, they obtain deliverance. And I know a number of you uh, are all hallelujah, you're saying to yourselves, um, because they, it says they, quote, obtain deliverance, but it goes on. The gloomy cloud that had covered their faces seemed gradually and visibly to disappear, and hope in smile brighten into joy. I want to just add here that if you go to and have seen, and I've seen these on videotape and uh, about shamanism, voodoo, and a lot of these tribes in Africa and these dancing frenzies and other trances that they get into, and they will, and they come out of their uh, trance, their so-called trance and frenzies, with a smile on their face, new creatures, so to speak. Okay? And so... Um, goes on to say, they would rise shouting deliverance and then would address the surrounding multitude in language truly eloquent and impressive with astonishment did I hear men, women, and children declaring the wonderful works of God and the glorious mysteries of the gospel. All right? These are happening at McGrady's meetings that had not happened anywhere in America at any church meeting since at the end of the first Great Awakening. Word of mouth spread as to what was happening throughout Kentucky and the adjacent states. Since there were so few churches and fewer pastors, Presbyterian, Baptists, and Methodists, you know, pretty much Pentecostal, I mean, uh, not Pentecostal, but uh, Protestant, they continued to combine their churches in the special outdoor, notice it says outdoor meetings. Now, again, i got to stop. I know a number of you are saying, oh, I've been, been to those Pentecostal outdoor meetings. That was wonderful. People were set free in the, in the Holy Spirit. And... Uh, and this is what's happening here. Hang in there. Keep listening. That's all i got to say. Now it says in these outdoor meetings, including both black freemen and slaves also attended. I want you to notice, and some of you probably won't see a problem with this. There's a big problem in America with this happening. Multiculturalism is creeping in in lots of different ways, and this is describing it back in, you know, 1799 and thereabout in that era. The attendees arrived in wagons, by horses, 
by donkeys and by foot. Thousands came from over a hundred miles away and stayed for several days at a time. Music, preaching, praying with extraordinary enthusiasm and excitement soon gave way to something very strange. You know, they kept opening the envelope and pushing the uh, pushing the envelope, shall we say, uh, much harder and inviting all kinds of, I'm going to tell you now, worldliness into these meetings and what was going on. All right. Quote, it came to a climax at Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Here's what it says, quote, Arguably, the most important religious gathering in all of America, American history. According to the Vanderbilt University historian Paul Konkin, C-O-N-K-I-N, Pastor Barton W. Stone of the Cane Ridge Presbyterian Church, after attending several of James McGrady, there's his name again, James McGrady's revivals, decided to host one himself at his church. He's thinking, well, maybe this of God, maybe this laughing movement. Remember a few years ago, laughing in the spirit. I remember hearing about ministers talking about that. and Well, maybe it's of God, and they would start laughing and just start uh, working up a frenzy in this laughing thing, calling it being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be careful, my friends. Be very careful with these strange things. When I was in the Pentecostal, quote, Pentecostal movement, or trying to be in it, I noticed all kinds of strange things. I remember after being there and watching for a little over a month, I watched this lady take the shoes off of her feet. I'm not kidding. Take the shoes off of her feet and start throwing it and uh, her shoes against the wall in, quote, the Holy Ghost. And people come up and lay their hands on her and pray with her. And just they would start shouting in joy and, and, and uh, jumping up and down, raising their hands and going into a frenzy. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. And I saw other strange things happen over the years I'm not going to get into. But listen as we read on here. Okay? But what happened there even startled him. And I think they're uh, referring to um, this um, uh, Pastor uh, Baron W. Stone startled even him after watching this. Approximately 30,000 people traveling hundreds of miles, came to the campground meetings. From Friday to the next Thursday, continuous preaching, prayers, shouting, and and singing took place with godly, quote, godly hysteria. Bodily exercises exercises such as uh, dropping, jerking, barking. Are you hearing this? Barking, uh, falling to the ground motionless for hours, getting slain in the spirit. Does that ring any bells again? Uncontrollable weeping, uncontrollable laughing, hugging, kissing, clasping of hands, uh, seeing visions, talking to the distressed, talking to one another, even talking to others of the meeting singing, shouting, rolling on the ground, falling into trances, uh, groans, babble of speech, loud prayers, impassioned preaching, and singing of hymns that had the music with the beat of voodoo drums. And you're saying, well, that could all be misinterpreted. There all could be... Wonderful biblical explanation for all these things, and you're making it sound just terrible. Hang in there. Hang in there. 
It goes on to say, nevertheless to say, the mainline denominations were shocked and angered. Thank God for that. They started. Some of them started waking up at what was happening at these services, but even more so at the, listen to this now, at the decadence that was occurring at many locations in the camp, campground. Drunkenness and disorderly conduct. You hearing? Drunkenness and disorderly conduct, including sexual intimacies, degenerated to that of a mini Mardi Gras. It was a common saying that at Cambridge, more souls were begotten than saved. This week-long ecumenical, multicultural, interracial uh, festival campground meeting cracked the foundation of Christian theology and Christian culture in America. Now, I'm going to have to close it off right there. Thank you, uh, Pastor Don Elmore, for providing that good research on that. And I know, again, many of you or some of you are going to maybe turn your nose up at what I just read there and what I've been saying about the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you again, my dear friends, that a lot of what we see and are given and what is passed off as the Holy Ghost is not of the Holy Ghost but is of this Arminian, uh, multicultural, Judeo-Christianity um, fraud. It's not biblical. It's not what the Bible describes as being truly filled with the Holy Spirit and having the true fruit of the Holy Spirit at all. You look at, again, the thousands and thousands of Judeo-Christian churches that are throughout America, they're not teaching people to wake up to righteousness. And some of them, very few though, are waking up to God's righteousness. Years ago, we were talking earlier about Judge Roy Moore, and God bless him for what he was doing because he put up a, sta uh, they, a statue, uh, not an idol, of the Ten Commandments there and uh, fought bravely to keep that uh, where it was uh, placed, I think it was in Alabama there. And now he's fighting the homosexual issue. God bless him. We need more of that type of ministry and ministers, because he does, even though he's a justice, does and is imparting true, a true biblical Holy Spirit-led, um, Holy Spirit, notice I said, a functional and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And people are listening. People's lives are being changed by what he's doing, and he's bravely speaking up. He needs more uh, help, more support in that area, and I'm sure he's, gonna, he's going to get it. But again, what we're seeing happening in Arminianism and the ecumenical movement and uh, the Judeo-Christian churches out there Again, we should not be referring to us ourselves in any way, shape, or form as Judaism Christianity. It's really what it is, Judeo-Christian Christian, uh, Christianity. We are being lied to, we are being deceived, and we need to come out of her and come out of those false practices 